Welcome to The Beat, your go-to where leaders, founders, and investors share insights on growth, innovation, and business building. I'm Chitra Nabat, your host. Joining us today is Max Cohen, Sprinter Health CEO and co-founder. Max, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. What is Sprinter Health? How does it work? Sure. So Sprinter Health, we have a staff of W-2 folks who have been trained in medical assistance skills, phlebotomy skills, community health worker skills. And so we actually go into homes to do care gap closure on behalf of health plans. So we'll do uh, A1C blood draws. We will do diabetic retinal exams using a high-tech uh, machine. Uh, we do blood pressure checks for hypertension, social needs screening, a number of different things that help plans get the quality measures that they need to within value-based care, but also get patients the preventive care that oftentimes they're not for, for go, that they're foregoing for a variety of reasons. The market is very fragmented in this space, and it can be confusing to know who to partner with and for what. Sure. So what's your sweet spot and your differentiator? Yeah, so we work across managed Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, and exchange populations. Um, you're absolutely right on the fragmentation. There are a ton of point solutions out there who are really good at the phlebotomy piece or who are a company that can go and find out about the social needs that people have. What Sprinter Health endeavors to do is to be a platform that aggregates up a number of those things so that we can kind of work on behalf of health plans and be able to cover 9, 15, 30 HEDIS measures so that they're going to be able to get the results they need all doing it within a consistent experience because of that W-2 staff. So the fact that we actually go in home, uh, there's a number of great companies that can send out kits. There are other companies that do virtual health or digital health, but there aren't that many that are actually physically going into the home. That's what Sprinter Health does, which allows us to build a rapport with the patient, be able to get truthful answers, and be able to get them kind of reintegrated into the health system. So quantify the biggest pain points you're solving for, and then on the flip side, an example of the impact, the your solution and that sure. the benefit of that. Uh, one of the services we do is, uh, we call it fit kit education or colorectal cancer testing education. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there that will mail kits and uh, a lot of folks get them and then throw it into the closet or throw it into the drawer. So Sprinter takes a little bit of a different approach there. We actually go in and we destigmatize things by using poop emojis in the text messaging. Uh, when we're in the home, uh, we show them how to use the scooper and we then tell them, hey, let's put the kit on the back of the toilet. So the next time you're there, you actually remember to go and do it. So we actually have 10X the return rates of just kind of broadly sending these things out, uh, which is a dramatic difference because this is something colorectal cancer can be treated often if it's caught early. Uh, and so from a patient perspective, it's something that's unpleasant, that's not fun to think about. And so just getting this kit in the mail is not really gonna do it. By actually having this added sprinter experience on top of it, it makes a change in terms of how they think about this kind of process. And I think that uh, we then do the follow-up, of course, we get them referred into uh, the right, their primary care physician or a specialist. Um, so the main thing here is that prevention only works if the entire workflow is defined well, where once you get that test result, you're gonna actually follow up. So sprinter does the care navigation, the other pieces as well to make sure they're seen by the right provider. But you just talked about a critical piece there, if the workflow is defined well. Right. And in so many cases, the workflow is not defined well, That's which right. is why we are in digital health with so many uh, hundreds to thousands of startups. Yeah. So talk about then how you uh, balance and operate with that uh, in many environments where the workflow is not defined sure. well. Well, I'll say this. It's actually a good thing that there are so many potential solutions because in healthcare, uh, there's no one winner. There's no way to say this is the right way to do it and we always do it. I was at Oculus before I joined Sprinter Health and we built a headset. That headset doesn't work if your eyes are more than 74 millimeters apart or if your eyes are less than 58 millimeters together. It doesn't work with certain hairstyles or with certain head sizes. That was okay because we were building a consumer grade device and we said if some people can't use it, that's fine. We'll just build for the ones who can. You can't do that in healthcare, especially in value-based care, where someone's on the hook for making sure that you're getting all the care you need over the course of uh, years. And so from that perspective, there is a time and a place for people who can do DIY stuff at home. There's a time and a place for people who can go into the clinic. But what about the people who can't? What about the people on Medicaid who might not get any sick time and can't leave their kids or who are scared about what the diagnosis could or are scared about what the cost could incur? You need to have a number of different solutions. And so we had to find a way to integrate within that where we can collaborate with everyone. We work with providers, we help them with their patients, we're not taking their patients away from them. We work with the kit companies because we can go and educate people on how to use it. So Sprinter's 
idea here was to say, let's take the most recalcitrant patients, called engaging the unengaged, the folks who are not showing up into the doctor's office, and then let's meet them where they're at physically so that we can actually help them through that process. Talk about the customer stakeholder acquisition, retention, engagement model, and the flow through to revenue. Sure. So your value proposition by each stakeholder, how do you get them in the door? How do you acquire, retain, engage? and the flow through to revenue. Sure. So we work on behalf of at risk, either providers or payers. So we have some provider groups that are at risk and have quality metrics that they want to hit, they contract with us directly. We also, uh, our main business is with health plans, managed Medicaid plans, exchange plans, and Medicare Advantage. Uh, at that point, the customer experience is always zero dollar copay and zero dollar deductible. Uh, there are just a number of folks who are worried about what healthcare will cost them and don't want to engage if, it's going to, if they have to go and run some numbers or call someone to find out what it is. So this is all stuff that is cleared by USPSTF. It's preventive medicine, preventive diagnostics, and so we're able to do that for a zero dollar cost to the end patient. The health plans pay us out of an ROI that essentially comes from hitting quality metrics. In Medicare, you want to be higher star ratings. If you get to four stars, you get bonus payments. If you get to four and a half or five, you get additional benefits. In managed Medicaid, states often have both penalties and incentives if they hit certain 80% of folks being screened for uh, dietic diabetic retinopathy, for instance. Um, and so there's different reasons for why the different payers work with us, but we work across the different groups and lines of business. Um, so they pay us directly. We uh, reach out to patients by email, text messages, phone. Uh, they can book directly if they want. They can self-book, or um, we also have folks who call them, of course, and can book that way. Uh, and then once that's done, that's pretty much it. So uh, we verify their identity, we show up at their home, and then we are going to uh, be built either through uh, uh, invoicing or through a claim with the payer at the end. What's your biggest barrier to market adoption at scale? And then how do you get over that? Sure, so uh, the biggest challenge is just the sheer scale of what's involved here. There are so many patients that just are not getting the care they need and there's been no dearth of attempts to get to them, right? So everyone, especially when it comes around time of Medicare, October enrollment, uh, they're gonna be bombarded by calls from people and mailings and things like that. So we do have to find a way to cut through that and let them know how convenient our service is uh, so that they wanna actually engage in it. Because at the end of the day, if a patient doesn't wanna do this, you can't force them to. Um, so that's always gonna be the biggest problem. Whether we were 10 or 100 exercise, it would still be the biggest problem. The way you do it is one, you build a little bit of rapport. So we work with their physicians directly. Uh, we have a 92 NPS over tens of thousands of appointments. So the patients who have seen us, they love having us come back and doing it again. So I think that's kind of like uh, the blocking tackling that put one foot in front of the other. You just have to prove to patients that this is a good, valuable experience to them uh, and then continue to do the hard work every day to continue to engage them. So no, uh, no magic switch then. Uh, to getting to market adoption at scale, because what's your what's your yeah. path? Like, what are the yeah. building blocks? Uh, when you think about your go to market sure. over the next few years, like, what's your path to that yeah. and time frame? So we're in seven states today. Uh, we're going to be in another four in the next two or three months, and probably another three or four later this year as well. Uh, what we like to do, because we are physically moving people, is we want to have as much density in a market as we can get. That doesn't mean that we can't handle suburbia or even exurbs, but we want to make sure that we have multi-payers. And the great thing about this is it's good for the payers for it not to be exclusive as well. Because ultimately the way this works is if we can see more patients in a day, we're more efficient, costs are lower for the payer. And so from that perspective, we, we pick the states based on where someone gives us enough business to go there. Uh, and then we layer on the relationships we have with the national payers for other regions. Um, so one example of that is we're gonna be launching Ohio here in a couple of weeks. We've already got multiple customers lined up that have been asking about Ohio. And so when we actually had an anchor customer who was able to give us enough to make it worthwhile, we called up the others. We said, hey, we can do this too. And they said, great. So we're gonna launch uh, probably within about two to three months of, of multiple different partners all within that state that we weren't even in a couple months ago. Uh, so that's really the method is pick a place that makes sense based on an anchor and then layer on the existing relationships we have elsewhere. From a, from a payer retention perspective, we've retained 100% of the payers that we had last year contracting with us again this year. Um, so the big piece that we always look at is, look, we know we're a, a startup. And so you have to execute by letting them hit the metrics that they need to hit. And then good things will happen if you do a good job. Where are you using AI at scale? 
Yeah, so uh, we're, when we look at AI, I, I think that the most useful piece is going to be on customer communication through LLMs. We've thought about, do we want to say, hey, what types of questions do you have? And we can pre-prepare for our NPs uh, a list of results, and then we can have them customize it from there. I think that uh, LLMs are going to be great for translation services, where a patient, if you don't have great coverage in terms of their language, um, you can maybe have a more enriching real-time experience through that. I am not uh, a big believer in AI being used for care delivery directly in the near future. Um, I was actually did a, the panel here and one of the questions was, um, when do you think AI will fundamentally change our houses so when you walk into the bathroom you get scanned and when you go into the kitchen it gets scans you into those kinds of things. And interestingly the panel, everyone said two to three years, I said 25 to 50. I think we're a long way off from uh, where, frankly, the hype is. I've been through this before. Uh, I was at Oculus and we built VR. And uh, it was something where if you look at the internal projections of how many units we ship, we smashed them. We delivered a lot more units than we ever thought we would uh, within that time frame. But the market expectations actually got so much farther out that some people said, hey, VR didn't actually work. In fact, people are enjoying it every day to the tune of tens of millions of them. Uh, and we were a small company. And so from that perspective, I think that there's a long way to go on the AI side before it's fundamentally changing interactions. Leadership. In life and business, there are rules, codes, norms to how things are done. Where have you been a code breaker and how did you do it? Uh, I guess the, the way I think about that is that um, I started my kind of tech career at, at Google. Um, and when I was at Google, I had certain ideas about ways to kind of pivot some of the businesses. And I ran into the very large company aspects of that. And I wasn't very effective, I think, at really moving that ship. Um, when I went to Oculus, it was a little bit different. I was more senior. Um, I, again, had views that were kind of counter to some of the conventional wisdom, but I got a little bit better at figuring out how to influence others. When I started Sprinter Health, here I am the CEO. I could theoretically tell people what to do, but what I learned over the past 10 years is that's a terrible idea. I, I, I talk about uh, Pulse uh, uh, employee surveys. I always tell my managers, like, it's really easy to get 100% on that. You can frankly not hold people to high standards and make their lives very easy and they will say you are a fantastic manager. Some of them will be disappointed because they rather you push them, but in general, I think that you can kind of game the way you run things to make people like you. I look at that the same way in terms of discussions. If you don't create a culture where people can push back, you're not gonna get the best out of the company that you can. Uh, and so the, the, the framework I like is when I tell people things, it's advice, it's not commands. They can go the complete opposite way. That is their prerogative. They better be right. Like if they wanna go the opposite direction of where we wanna go, they should have a good foundation for it and they should be able to prove that with data pretty quickly and then I will be gladly convinced to move in that direction instead. But I think that um, to run a company effectively from a leadership perspective, you have to hire good people and you have to trust them. You have to give them accountability, but you also have to give them freedom in order to make decisions. And that's really hard, I think, for some of the, the younger founder group to do. Um, but if you're gonna run a company that scales, it's pretty necessary. Max. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.